Welcome to the show, Raful. Thanks, Carlos. It's great to be here. I'm excited to have you because uh, it's not of, it's not common to see a longtime executive in product that decides to bite the bullet and literally build their own startup. I see that you've spent what is it like 20 years in in product with most of it at Microsoft, right? Yes, I was there at Microsoft for uh, uh, some time, and then after that. I also worked at uh, a startup, um, uh, and then I started my first company, uh, which I sold in two years, and this is my second company. Your current company is Chisel. Tell us a little bit more, please. Yeah, so uh, uh, Carlos Chisel is a platform for product managers, and basically, we uh, the platform has basically three parts. The first part is we use AI to automate critical product management workflows so that their busy work reduces and they are able to focus more on strategic work. So the examples of this include things like, you know, them being able to create product uh, PRDs or uh, functional specifications within seconds using AI, automatically creating status reports using AI, automatically synthesizing, classifying customer uh, feedback using AI, et cetera. Uh, so that's the AI part. Underneath that, we have, uh, it's a two-in-one system for customer feedback as well as roadmaps. So on the feedback side and the discovery side, uh, they can basically use Chisel's first-party tools like customer portal or idea box or surveys to collect feedback from customers, uh, analyze uh, that feedback using AI, etc. And then from that, they can identify the uh, key things they want to build in their roadmap. So that's the third piece of the platform is the roadmap platform where they can uh, uh, create their roadmap. They can synchronize with engineering tools like uh, Jira or Azure DevOps and basically uh, execute on the platform. So those are basically the three parts of uh, Chisel. So first thing that comes to mind uh, is, well, <clears throat> you and I have been around the product industry for some time. And when I started seeing products specifically created for product managers, they tend to focus on one particular use case. Or for example, yeah. the, the analytics category or the prototyping category or A-B testing category. It seems like you are taking more of a platform approach with multiple use cases. So we'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, see, I think, I think if you look at uh, product management as a discipline, right? One of the main problems that uh, product, management, product managers face is that their data is kind of fragmented all over the place. Spreadsheets, some other tools from where they are collecting customer feedback, some tools where they track engineering items, etc. Now, it results in a lot of copy-paste back and forth, and also it results in loss of uh, traceability. So a very good example is that some, some uh, products are only focused on feedback, right? So at that point, it is unclear how the feedback that was captured is, is actually affecting or influencing the roadmap. Vice versa, some platforms focus only on roadmaps. And then the most natural question that most stakeholders, including the executives and the uh, peers of a VP of product, for example, would have is, why are we building this user story or feature? Right? Why are we prioritizing this so high? And those questions come up because there is no traceability to the original customer feedback that resulted in prioritizing this. So I think I'm a big believer that feedback and roadmap are basically the two sides of the same product management coin. And there has to be a great link and traceability between that. And the only way to do that is to have a, have a system of record underneath, right? Which is the same system of record where there is a continuous or seamless flow between the customer requirements that you are analyzing all the way leading up to uh, your roadmap and how it is being executed by the engineering team. So. Focusing on one of them would kind of, you know, again, result in a similar fragmentation, which is what I'm trying to avoid in the first place, right? We are trying to give PMs a platform where they can do most of their day-to-day -day job. Yeah, and that's a very strategic decision, right? You, you, you have certain resources and you have to choose how you allocate them. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of founders and, and product leaders kind of evolve their vision and say, well, you know what, I'm going to focus on this particular use case or feature. And then in the future, I would love to do something else. It seems like you decided to, you, you, your vision is, okay, I see these two use cases as pretty much one. They are all interconnected. So I'm going to go for them at the same time. So I'm, I'm curious, 
what are the trade-offs for you? Like, how are you able to ensure that there is the right resource allocation so you can go also go deep enough? Yeah, I think what we did, Carlos, was for exactly the same reason, we took some time to uh, bake our platform before we actually launched it, right? And so uh, you're, you're exactly correct. It took us a little longer in terms of making sure that we have the MVP, minimal viable product on both sides, right? And then we went to that market, that, uh, market with that product. Uh, uh, it resonated very well with the customers. And then we got some feedback about, you know, what are the areas that they would like us to kind of improve on top of that, right? And so we, we have been taking a gradual approach and we are extremely customer focused. So when we launch, we essentially listen to the customer that, okay, this is what it is. What, do you, what would you like to see next over here? And we add those things. And we are, we are basically, you know, combining those two approaches. One being, we are being very customer focused. Second being that we also have a vision on where we want to take this product, particularly in terms of, you know, having a powerful uh, AI and automation story, which can, which can automate PM's work and give them a lot of time back, which they can use for strategic work. And how are you thinking about integrations with third-party tools to cover additional use cases that might not be covered by your particular platform yet? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, question. What we are focused on, Carlos, is, is basically providing a 360-degree view to the product manager. Because, you know, product management job is right at the center, right? It connects with engineering, it connects with user experience, it connects with marketing, etc. So our integration strategy is focused on bringing that data into Chisel so that the product manager can get a 360-degree view. So examples of this is on the customer discovery side, we connect with uh, systems like Salesforce to get all the sales data and understand which customers uh, contribute to most of the revenue and therefore which, which requirements we should prioritize higher. We connect to systems like Zendesk or Intercom to take all the customer feedback and support related tickets to give an idea to the product manager about you know, what, where is the customer pain at this point in time. Uh, similarly, on the other end, uh, when product managers have a roadmap together and they are executing, we focus on, on integrating with engineering tools like Jira. See, what we don't want is a double data entry, right? If you have to enter data in Chisel and then also enter the similar data in Jira, then it, it becomes a pain point for both engineers and product managers. So we have invested a lot in building a very powerful two-way integration between Jira and uh, Chisel or Azure DevOps, which is a Microsoft system for similar things uh, to Chisel, right? And because our integration is very deep, there is no duplicate data entry, there is no inconsistency of data, and it just works kind of seamlessly. So that's how we think about integration in terms of we are very, like, you know, in the product development lifecycle, right from customer discovery all the way to actually shipping the product and closing the loop for validation with the customers, everything that is needed in terms of data integration, that's what we are prioritizing right now. An image that comes to mind is a classic SaaS tool that always puts themselves in the middle and says, and everybody else is just bringing us their data, right? So right. trying to replace the spreadsheet. Uh, so in the same way, I see your point on like obviously connecting to other tools, bringing that information to your platform. Um, curious to know if you also see the reverse case when uh, it's a certain person who is living on a different tool and they are able to import some of the data that lives uh, on Chisel, for example. 100%. I, I think you are 100% correct that, you know, that picture that comes to your mind, right? It is often centered on a persona. So for instance, you know, if you if you draw that picture for a sales persona, the sales will be in the middle and they will show all the tools around the sales process to kind of, for the sales persona to be successful, right? So, so I think that approach is kind of valid, right? Because if you are making a purpose-built tool for a particular persona, then you have to start with that persona in the center. And, and, and the same applies for Chisel, right? That we put the product manager in the center, right? And we say, look, this is the flow or this is the critical life cycle for product management. And what are the inputs to that life cycle? And what is this life cycle ultimately producing? So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk with you about the, the pillars of product. I know you have strong opinions around yeah. that. So please tell us more. Yeah, no, I, I think, see... Uh, in terms of you know the role of the product management, that is very well documented in many cases, right? And it's a pretty wide role starting right from customer uh, uh, discovery all the way to shipping the product and closing the loop with the customers. So I think my uh, like what I'm what I've been talking about recently is not really to re-articulate what the role of the product manager is, 
but actually to put it more in light of how has it changed or what is the modern product management about right what are the areas where we should uh, i've seen product management management being very successful at focusing and and being successful in in today's environment so i call it you know those those five things that you are referring to i call it as the pillars of the modern product management that yes product management has been a very well documented role for some time but if you look at that role today here are the five things that i care about right and i think that on like those five things uh uh i start again from the uh, uh discovery side right everyone talks about the importance of uh, feedback and 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 my take on that is you have to operationalize that feedback so what what i mean by that is imagine uber right where you are uh, when you finish the ride it immediately actually shows you uh, the screen to give feedback on the driver right and then that information is collected and used for driver rating and actually matching purposes later on so that is an example of operationalizing you just not it's not about just collect and sit on it and at some point we will use it it is operationalizing in every transaction right so that's what that's why the word like emphasis on operationalizing then uh, second pillar i always talk about ruthless prioritization right yes everyone makes a road map but today the product management job has become very demanding because the market is moving very fast the competition is moving very fast so it becomes super important to your point earlier to have a very ruthless prioritization of where are we going to focus right that's so that's like the second pillar the the third pillar i often talk about is ai has changed the game right you can use ai in very meaningful ways to actually get ahead of the competition and achieve your business results much faster so leveraging ai the fourth pillar i often talk about is have a system of record right there is a lot of valuable data that product managers produce over a period of time but imagine if i had a lot of uh, data collected in 2023 about why we should build a particular uh, feature or a user story and for whatever reason let's say if we didn't end up building it if that knowledge gets lost in 24 when we revisit that someone has to recreate reinvent the wheel and collect all the data system of record is about persisting all this data so that you can take advantage of that data over a period of time in fact you can then have a powerful system like ai running on top of that so i often talk about this four principle fourth principle of you know hey have a system of record and then the final thing i i talk about is aligning the team that uh, product one of the key jobs of product manager is aligning the team on why are we doing these things why is this strategic and what do we need to do to have a successful uh launch for this thing and 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 i've seen many products fail and many teams uh implode because the productivity and the team is killed by the misalignment uh amongst the team members themselves so i talk about that as like the fifth uh, pillar of modern product management no thank you for 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 sharing that and yeah, i agree like when when i started in product or started the company there wasn't really that much like still was a lot of confusion around what does the product manager do i think we've evolved quite a bit as an industry and now it's more about how can this product manager role really add value to the business right beyond just adding value to the user i agree i agree we've gone through a fundamental kind of shift there and product management discipline is becoming more and more aware about driving those uh, business or strategic outcomes So I uh, just want to talk a little bit about your experience at Microsoft. You talked about how you you've seen a lot of products go very well and others not so well. So I have here you worked on Xbox, DVD player, Windows Phone, <laughs> after, yeah. uh Office 365. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about some of those biggest um your your biggest learnings on products that didn't work. Yeah, I th- I think what to uh, see uh uh time and again what I have found Carlos is that it it basically boils down to the first principles right very successful products uh underpinning that what i have seen is that people have uh, product managers have a really good sense on what the customers want what the market wants and based on that uh uh information then the next step uh, basically is about you know are we creating a product that the customers will fall in love with right and as long as those two things are met where you know you on one hand you have a really concrete handle on what the customer and the market need is and on the second hand you uh, really are great at crafting a product that kind of meets that need 
uh, that could result in a really powerful product. Now, in some cases, you know, uh, you could have a great uh, uh, go-to-market advantage. So as an example, let's say that, you know, I do both things really well. But if I'm in a startup and I don't have a really powerful distribution channel, then I still need to solve the problem of go-to-market and having a really powerful sales and uh, marketing uh, uh, muscle or a great distribution channel. But let's say if you're working at a company like Microsoft and you're shipping a product as a part of Office 365, as a hypothetical example, right? Then you have an amazing distribution channel, right? And at that point, you, you have to worry less about distribution and more about whether the product uh, is the right fit for the users that you're shipping in. But I think what I've seen is, regardless of whether the whether we are working at a large company or a small company, regardless of whether it was a consumer product or uh, uh, enterprise product, uh, B2B or uh, otherwise, uh, it has always come down to the basic principles, right? There hasn't been like a uh, outlier somewhere where I found that the product failed because something that we had, uh, that was never discussed before, or it hasn't been considered a strategic priority before. Yes, I am so curious to know your perspective now as a founder, um, because I agree with in, investing time in, in customer in customers discovery in, in in data and having a good finger on the pulse on what's going on in the market. But at the end of the day, it's a human's decision, right? What to build yeah. next. And founders or CPOs are very opinionated, and sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. Correct. I'm speaking for myself. Like sometimes I make a big bet based on reasonable data, but I still pushed it because I believed that it was going to work. And, and sometimes I, I was wrong. So yes. I'm curious to know how you, like if there's any specific situation you, you can think of when you were, you know, at such a company like, like Microsoft, where you are like, you know what? Yeah, we, we have the teams, they did the research, they did everything, but we're still going to push for something that is not completely clear. Well, I think that, you know, uh, uh, almost in every products, I've had uh, that kind of situation where uh, certain decisions are very clear based on the data and you can apply your analytics uh, analysis skills to that and you know come up with some kind of an output. But I think a large part of PM role is also about uh, intuition, right? That or judgment that, okay, I've been in this space for some time. Uh, I think that either given lack of very uh, clear data or either given uh, uh intuition that here is the right way to kind of think about things right um you apply that uh, uh, judgment so uh, like you know if, if you think about uh, uh you you know you brought up uh, windows phone right uh, windows phone we were working on that time and iphone had just launched and what uh, what was happening in the market that time is you know uh, uh the android ecosystem essentially had just uh, mimicked the interface uh, on the home screen of the phone, right? All the same icons and both kind of screens look pretty similar. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of data in the market that, yes, you know, this kind of uh, interface is really resonating with people. So if you had just made a data, pure data-based decision that, you know, uh, there was one valid path ahead of just basically mimicking that experience. But uh, as a team, we ended up taking a different approach, right? We ended up taking an approach about, you know, hey, what do we think is uh, more powerful as an interface, right? And we came up with the Metro design where we were the people who first launched light tiles, right? Where the it was not about icons, it was about tiles on the home page, and those tiles were alive, right? They were contextual. The data in the tile changed every time, so much so that we got a lot of kudos in the market for being authentic on that experience. And that's a great example of you know that was not really a decision which was based on past data. It was a decision based on intuition and creativity. And some people would call it product sense. So yeah. I would love to get your your take on on how what is what is product sense and and where are some ways to for, for product people to improve it? Yeah, I I think um, the the uh, simplest way for me to describe uh, product sense is uh, a product manager's ability to really understand user needs and creating six products that successfully satisfy those needs that automatically results in the business outcomes that you are looking for. So that's the simplest way to kind of, you know, describe product science. And I, you know, a lot of people talk about product science in terms of what is it, and they, they have different ways to uh, kind of uh, uh, 
uh, compartmentalize that, right? Or break it down in different parts. I think of product sense uh, having uh, four main elements, right? One is having a really good understanding of customer needs. Second is having a really good domain understanding that what is the domain in which you are working, right? Like for instance, you know, if you are in banking, it's a pretty deep domain and you need to understand the banking uh, uh, the world uh, in order to be successful in that space. So domain knowledge is like the second thing. The third thing I talk about is analytical skills of a product manager. Given a bunch of data, you know, how do you apply your analytical skills to come to the right conclusions and, and, and extract insight from that data to make uh, informed decisions? And the last part I talk about is creativity, that having all these things, like when you think that, yeah, you know, here is the problem that I want to solve. Here is why I want to solve the problem. Then you start thinking about what is the best way to solve the problem, right? And that's where creativity kicks in. That's where uh, intuition kicks in, where uh, using creativity, you can kind of solve the problem in a way that has never been uh, solved before and customers kind of fall in love with it. So those are the four aspects I think of when I think about uh, product sense. I, I like your definition, how you break it down into four different elements, because from the outside, sometimes the word intuition can be perceived as just magic, right? Like, oh, yeah. whatever, I just have an idea, but no, there's still a relatively structured approach and there's a way for anyone to really improve their product sense. I agree. In fact, you know, there is a, uh, uh, a lot of times, you know, there is a conversation about product sense, either you have it or you don't have it. Either you are born with it or you are, you are not. I disagree with that. You know, see, there are parts in product sense which are very much uh, something that a PM can make themselves really good at, right? Like, think about customer needs, right? There are qualitative techniques, there are quantitative techniques to understand this better. And it's not rocket science. A PM can really get really good at that if they train themselves. And, you know, uh, to that point, even product school has a lot of uh, good training content on that, right? You guys are doing a great job on that. And so... Uh, that's an example. Uh, uh, domain knowledge. Yes, you know, let's say that if I'm new to banking, I cannot uh, overnight have a domain knowledge that a person who has been in the banking space for 15 years will have. But if I work hard and try to understand the domain, I can do a lot of uh, 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 reading and, and analysis to get up to speed in a year or so where I can start to make uh, meaningful decisions, right? Same with analytical tools. For analysis, there are a lot of tools in the market. The product manager can make themselves really uh, uh, familiar with those tools and start to use those tools in their in their day to day work. Where I think the part where some product managers have a natural advantage is the last part of creative thinking. Right? They may be really good at out of box thinking or creative thinking, a, a really powerful right brain kind of a situation. But guess what? Now what's happening is that given uh, the advance, the given given where Gen AI is headed and how AI is actually even uh, making that part uh, uh, easier, so to say. You know, Figma has a bunch of tools which are based on AI. Adobe Creative Cloud has a bunch of tools which are based on AI. So these tools actually help a product manager think outside the box. They will they will see a lot of different ways to kind of you know build the same thing, prototypes, examples, and then they can iterate fast on that. It doesn't have to be their own uh, kind of creativity. So yes, a lot of things are in PM's control in developing a great product sense. You use the magic word. Uh, you said AI. So we need to we need to go down that rabbit hole. And <laughs> yesterday I was at a dinner with with other product executives, and someone said, "Well, when things work, we call it AI. When things don't work, we call it Gen AI." So I know you are also <laughs> on, on, on this topic. Like, tell me more about about the different types of of AI and how you think that product teams can make the most out of it. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I mean, again, a lot of people have classified uh, the AI uh, or the taxonomy for AI, right? Whether uh, um, uh, if you take like, you know, some key examples, obviously the most uh, uh, prominent example is uh, Gen AI. Uh, after, you know, ChatGPT was launched, um, uh, a lot of powerful scenarios uh, came to the surface. And... Uh, uh, and it's, it's really powerful, even, for example, in, in Chisel, right? We use Gen AI in a lot of places, for instance, to uh, help the product managers create uh, PRDs automatically, help them create status report, help them create summaries of features, etc. So Gen AI, obviously, is a big part of that. 
Uh, outside of Gen AI, there is actually a pretty big world too. In fact, you know, we just did a fireside chat about a couple of weeks ago in uh, Palo Alto on this topic, that there is more to AI than Gen AI. And I think over there, the uh, uh, two or three prominent uh, uh, examples that come to mind is first of all is robotics, right? There's a lot of work being done in robotics, whether you think about human robots or whether you think about robotics, uh, the way it is used in factories. Uh, related to that, there is a lot of wor work happening in computer vision uh, today. Uh, and, and that's applied once again, uh, right from uh, self-driving cars to uh, uh, factory floors uh, in terms of you know uh, detecting manufacturing defects, etc. So computer vision continues to be a big uh, uh, area. Uh, Self-driving, uh, obviously, you know, uh, we see that everywhere around this, uh, around us. Uh, one of the other things where I've seen a lot of uh, successful work in the AI space is uh, uh, using predictive analytics, right? A lot of companies are developing technology for uh, predictive analytics, including uh, Chisel. So for instance, we have in Chisel a uh, uh, Chisel AI assistant which kind of monitors your workspace and draws your attention to features or user stories which might be slipping, right? Or dependencies which might get compromised and suggest actions to you. So predictive analytics has, has kind of become, even in this, in, in for example, security space, you see a lot of usage of predictive analytics, et cetera. There is anomaly detection, right? Where, uh, 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 once again, the prominent space where this is used very uh, uh, powerfully is security. Right? What are the anomalies we detect in terms of the access patterns to our services and how can we identify a uh, threat? And, and, and obviously, you know, if you, if you kind of go be, uh, uh, as a foundation layer below all of that is the classic uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, models, right? Regression machine learning models, which are used not only in many of the technologies that I described, but even outside of that for any kind of uh, AI machine learning driven work. So that's how I kind of think about this, uh, the uh, high-level uh, taxonomy. <laughs> I like how you structure questions in general because it's an easy way for someone to just understand the different options and the, the pros and cons on each of them. Sometimes reading a headline, right, or seeing just the word AI on a website can be misleading. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I want to grab up this interview with a hot take. Uh, I know you are big on efficiency versus effectiveness. So please tell me more about that. Yeah, I think, you know, what I have found, Carlos, is that a lot of people start to think about efficiency first, right? And, and what is, like, you know, the idea there is that, hey, um, uh, let's do this the right way, right? Let's focus on doing things the right way so that we can get efficiency, we can become faster. But I think the, if you are you know, going in the wrong direction, then no matter how fast you are, it's actually not really useful. It, it's counterproductive, your speed and efficiency. You will just produce garbage at a really efficient rate, right? So I think that my approach has always been that, yes, the efficiency part comes second. First, let's uh, be effective. What that means is, Let's first figure out, are we doing the right things? If we are doing the right things, even inefficiently, and if we are heading in the right direction, then we can always solve the problem of running faster in that direction, subsequently, right? This is the classic uh, conversation that has happened in the past, in other words, of you know uh, precision versus accuracy, right? Precision, being very precise is like you know being very efficient, but you may not be hitting your target accurately, right? There, uh, whereas, uh, uh, in my mind, what's really what, what you need to first focus on as a product manager is, are you actually accurate? Are you hitting it in the right direction? If you're hitting it in the right direction, then you can make it really uh, efficient and do th uh, get the result at a much uh, kind of faster rate. Well, thank you, Praful, for this master class on product management, AI, and efficiency versus effectiveness. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Carlos. It's been a pleasure to talk as well.